Okay, welcome everyone. And we're going to be learning about waiting after eating a dairy meal before eating meat. And the first source that we have on this is a Gemara in Masechet Chulin. And this Gemara is the same Gemara that we saw regarding waiting to eat dairy after meat. And it's very interesting, uh, it's a much longer sugya, and we're just going to take little snapshots of it, and I'll try and explain as we go along. And the Gemara says as follows, Amar Rav Chizda, Achal Basal, Asur Lecho Gavina. And this is what we learned already. If one ate meat, it's forbidden to eat cheese with it. But Gevina, if one ate dairy or cheese, Mutar Lecho Basar. One can eat meat right after. So if we stop the class right now, there's nothing to talk about. Have cheese, and then you can eat meat straight away. Rabbi, why are we having a class? It's straightforward. But if you carry on, it gets a little bit more complicated. And we're actually going to go to the previous Amud, the previous uh, folio of the Gemara, where it has an interesting discussion about Igra, the father-in-law of Rabbi Abba. And it's taught about him, of Ugvinan Echo Nechalin Be'efikorin. He would eat chicken and cheese, Efikorin, which is translated here as freely, but I would say he eats it backwards and forwards. He's not careful about chicken and cheese. Hutanila, and he teaches it, Vuhu amarla, belonetilat yadaim, uvlo kinu And he says this, that you don't need to be careful, not with washing your hands, and not with rinsing out your mouth. So chicken and cheese, there seems to be no issue neither the chicken to the cheese, which is surprising to us, and certainly no issue of cheese followed by the chicken. Then the Gemara says, Rav Yitzchak, braider of Mesharshia, so Rav Yitzchak, the son of Rav Mesharshia, ikla lebe Ravashi, he was visiting the house of Ravashi, aitule gvina, Aha, they brought him some cheese and he ate. Aitule bisra. Aha, they brought him some meat and he ate. And the Gemara notes, Velo mashayade, and he did not wash his hands. Amrele, they said to him, Vaha tani igra chamu adarabi abba, ofu gvina nechalin beefi korin. Ofu gvinain. They said, regarding the teaching of Igra, the father-in-law of Rabbi Abba, who says you can eat chicken and cheese together, or you can eat them in this carefree manner, that's talking about chicken and cheese. But if I want to have cheese and then I want to have red meat, Surely that's not permitted. Amar lehu, he said to them, Hane mile belelia. Rabbi Yama, hachazina. What does it say there? So here's what the Gemara really means when it says, and here he is actually explaining the teaching of of, of Igra Chamoa de Rabbi Abba, when it says he ate them carefree manner, it doesn't mean he ate chicken and then he ate cheese right away. It means he eats cheese and then he would eat chicken right away without washing his hands and without cleaning out his mouth. But that's chicken and cheese. But regarding cheese and meat he would eat cheese and then he would eat meat so the gemara is asking why aren't you washing your hands why aren't you cleaning out your mouth he says ha 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 i don't need to wash my hands why because it's during the day during the day i can look at my hands and i can see are my hands too greasy and full of meat meat fats if they're not full of meat fats or alternatively since i used a knife and fork I'm just adding that in, as an interjection. 
I can eat my cheese and then go straight into meat without any concern. The Gemara continues. Ella, Beit Shammai Omrim. And this is the way we're going to get into the halakha side of the sukya. If one eats cheese and they want to eat meat, Beit Shammai says, Mekaneach v'hu adin madiach. You need to clean out your mouth. And the law is also that you need to rinse out your, you need to also wash your hands. Okay? Or that you need to, uh, another way of answering it is, uh, wipe your mouth and one is rinsing. And then we have this teaching where Beit Hillel says very similar. Madiach adin le You need to rinse and you also need to uh, floss. Ma'amachada o ma'amachada v'lo plige. One teaches one and one teaches the other, and they're not arguing. I eat both hold, you need to rinse and you need to floss. You need to have a really good brushing of your teeth if you want to have cheese and then eat meat. The hilchata, and this is the halacha. The chol mile have a mekinuach. You can clean out your mouth with anything. Labar mekimcha tamre viyarka, except three things. Kimcha, which is kemach, which is, which is flour, F-L-O-U-R, dates, tamre, and yarka, vegetables, everything else you can use because they are going to uh, clean out your mouth, where those other things, they kind of stick to your palate. They don't really uh, clean out the mouth as much. So if we're looking at what we've seen so far, what's clear is, or not clear, it's a very difficult to hear, in fact. If we just had a Rav Chizda, I'd be very happy. He sees the only issue is eating meat and then wanting to have cheese, which is what we learned for the last two weeks. But if one has cheese first, one can eat meat straight away. Then we had the teaching of Igra, the father-in-law of Rabbi Abba, who would eat chicken and cheese care in a carefree manner, which we said means he wouldn't wash his hands or rinse his mouth or floss. And then we had Rabbi Yitzhak who said the, the cleaning of the hands is only needed during the day, during the nighttime when you can't see. But during the day, and perhaps today with our electricity at night, it would not be an issue. And Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel say you need to rinse and you need to floss, or you need to use some sort of a food substance to wipe out any cheese which could be in the palate or in the teeth or in the mouth and some and some and some sides. Now we're going to go into the uh, Shulchan Aruch. So this is Rav Yitzhak Cairo. This is a Sephardic approach to Halakha. And he says, Achal Gvina mutar lechol basar acharav basar miyad. If one ate cheese, one is allowed to eat meat right after. Just like Rav Chizda, just like the Gemara and Chulin. Bilvad sheyayen yadam shelo yeh shum davar mehagevina nidbak bahem. Provided that he looks carefully at his hands, okay, he inspects his hands in order to make sure that there was no cheese which has stuck to them. Ve'im haya balayla, and if it was night time, she'eno yachol la'ayen otam heitev, where he's not able to look at them carefully because it's too dark, sarich lo'ach sam, he needs to wash them. And then he adds, this is the position, that, that was the position of those, that was the position of, uh, or the interpretation of what uh, Igret, the father-in-law of, uh, that position there, the, the interpretation of Igra, the father-in-law of Rabbi Abba, that he's not careful with chicken and cheese, but he's careful with meat and cheese. Uh, that there, he needs to uh, wash his hands. But they, when he says, he also needs to wipe his mouth and rinse it, or floss it and rinse it. And how do you clean out your mouth? How do you wipe it? You chew bread. And that's a really good way that you can clean out your mouth. In fact, you can really do it with anything. And he goes, quotes the Gemara, except for the three cardinal things you can't use, flour, dates, and veggies. 
לפי שהם נדבקים בחניכיים והם מקנחים יפה, because they, they will cling to the palate, they will not, uh, they, they, will not they will not remove the, uh, the cheese. ואחר כך ידיח פיו במים או יין, and then you rinse out your mouth with water or wine. במה זה רמב"ם? בואו נמוך איזה שהוא דילינג with בבשר, בהימה וחיה. And this is all dealing with red meat or wild animal meat like, uh, like deer or the like. אבל אם בא לאכול בשר עוף, but if you wanted to eat chicken אחר גבינה after dairy, אינו צריך לא קינוח ולא נטילה. You don't require no, not the bread and not the wine or the water. Okay, and that was the position of the, uh, of Igra, the, far, uh, the Igra we saw there. Okay, so that's what we see the Shulchan Aruch really summarizes all those she taught and comes up with a nice straightforward halacha. If you want to eat cheese, you want to eat meat after cheese, you've got to clean your hands, you've got to rinse out your mouth with water or wine, you've got to have some bread. But that's only if it's red meat. If it is chicken, then you don't need to do that. And when we talk about washing the hands, that's only if you can't look at them well during the day. All right, that's so far, we've got a good class. We would be so far happy with all our positions. We Sfaradim can have our dairy and then we can have some meat later on. No problems asked. Okay, then there's this position here of the Sefer HaKashrut, which talks about brushing one's teeth well, can also be done instead of using the solid or liquid food. And that's why I said that whole position of having the bread or the wine, that's more when they didn't really have toothbrushes or chewing gum or something like that or flossing or any of that. Now, I want to go into, and we're going to have a look at this, there's a very interesting piece by, in, 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 uh, in the Zohar, which uh, the Bet Yosef, which Rav Yosef Cairo quotes in, uh, in his magnum opus, the Bet Yosef, which is his commentary to the Tor. And normally it's rare to quote Kabbalah in halachic sources, and yet here we have a very interesting position where he says, there are those who are machmir, who are strict upon themselves, that they don't eat meat after dairy in the same meal. Why? Because of something written in the Zohar. And the Zohar says in Parashat Mishpatim, this is the language, Anyone who eats this, meat after dairy together, or within one hour, or within one meal, an image of a roasted kid is seen in the shell of the person for 40 days, and a group of impure angels will approach him so they can identify him and punish him accordingly, and will cause judgment to be aroused in the world judgment that is not holy. This is a very strange, wacky, out there, wild Kabbalistic position. Therefore, those of us who are deeply Kabbalistic are very frightened of this piece and would not do that. However, the vast majority of us who are not superstitious or are not Kabbalistic in nature would say, that's a very strange piece. Put it to one side and say, okay, strange. Here's the real reason. I mean, again, that would be a reason why Sepharadim, who are Kabbalistic, wouldn't eat dairy. But here is why our Ashkenazic brothers and sisters are more careful with waiting after cheese. And it comes here. Ukva katav ha Mordechai. The Mordechai. Is a very important Rishon from Germany. He wrote about his teacher, the Rav, Rav Meir Merottenberg, the following story. He made a rule that he would not eat meat after cheese. Why? One time, he was uh, 
he found a piece of cheese in his mouth in between his teeth and he was between one meal and the next and he decided to himself he decided to be strict upon himself again this was a personal stricture a personal humrah that he took upon himself and this became the mainstream position in ashkenaz veins a kocholek al talmud he's not being he's not arguing with the talmud He's not being like someone who adds as if he's detracting. And he never saw this piece of the Kabbalah, which I quoted above. Even this, he would still be strict upon himself. Because of what happened to him personally. Even though he was leaning it with chicken, because he never saw the Zohar. But we who have seen the Zohar, it's proper to be strict even after chicken. Therefore, there is a Kabbalistic custom amongst very few Sephardim to be careful about all types of meat after dairy, to not eat them within the same hour or during the same meal. However, since it is not codified in Shulchan Aruch, as we saw above, clear to see, it was not in the Shulchan Aruch, which is the main legal code. Therefore, it is not the mainstream Sephardic custom. However, since Maram Merottenberg was quoted, he's a very important Ashkenazic Rishon, we're going to see that the Ashkenazic position is different to that. Okay, and indeed what I just summarized there is exactly what Ravavaji Yosef says. That Sephardim do not need to wait at all before eating meat. And you can see that here in source number six, he says here, I was asked about one who wishes to eat meat after eating cheese. Must he wait the same amount of time as one who eats cheese after meat? Or does he not need to wait at all? And he writes, the, uh, the conclusion of the law, Strictly speaking, it's permitted to eat meat after cheese, after you have cleaned out your mouth. Okay, and that's eating the bread or having the drink, or as I said, brushing your teeth or whatever. And whoever wants to be strict upon themselves to not eat meat after cheese, rather he waits an hour or more, know that he's doing this out of piety, or that he's doing a stricture, he's doing a chumrah, not that this is mi'ikar hadin, this is the strict din. And if he wants to do hatarat nadarim, he wants to annul his vow so that he can change his minhag, let him do it. And then he would be able to eat the meat right after the cheese. Okay, however, one who did that's only, he only needs to do hatarat nadarim if he knew that it was a chumrah or an act of piety. But if he thought that that was the straight halacha, and he was not allowed to eat meat after dairy, then he doesn't need hatarat nedarim at all. And he can go straight into it completely because he was under the mistaken nature and he's under the mistaken notion that there was a prohibition. Now, so far we've established a Sephardic approach. Sephardic approach, 95% or more, except for the extremely pious who have this rare chumrah, we eat dairy, we, sorry, we eat meat right after dairy. Now let's have a look at the Ashkenazim. V'yesh machmirin, but there are those who are strict. Afilu basacha gvina, even meat after cheese. V'cheino hagim, and so we are accustomed. And notice, friends, that is the same language that they do for kitniot. So any Ashkenazi who you know is careful about kitniot, they're going to be careful about this. 
אין אוכלים אחריה אפילו בשר עוף. If it is hard cheese, and here's where the Ramah adds a special language. He uses the word hard cheese. גבינה קשה. אין אוכלים אחריה אפילו בשר עוף. One does not allow to eat after it, even chicken. And one needs to wait. כמו גבינה אחר בשר. Just like cheese after meat. So a straight reading of it would imply that if one waits six hours to eat dairy after meat, I would have to wait six hours to eat meat after dairy. But then he adds, V'chein hu bezohar. And this appears in the Zohar, but yet we read the Zohar, and the Zohar was saying it's only a problem in the same meal or the same hour. And we also remember from last week that the Ramah brought down those positions of waiting one hour, and those who want to be strict can wait six hours. So perhaps as a way of reading the Ramah, that he means just not in the same hour. Then he adds, V'yesh mekilin, there are those who are lenient, V'ein limachot, and should not uh, protest those who are lenient. Just make sure that they really clean out their mouths well with the eating of the bread and the rinsing, and that they wash their hands. Mihu tov lahachmir, and however it's good to be strict. And again, I'm not bashing Ashkenazim, it's just an important language. When you hear the language, it's good to be strict, that is a language which for uh, in the Ashkenazic world is that's exactly what I want to do. Like you're telling me I can be strict is almost saying, is this, is the sky blue? Is the, you know, is the sun out? Like it's, you, you have to be strict. It's not even a choice. It's not tov lahachmir, tzarich lahachmir almost when reading that. Uh, so here the Ramah mentions waiting after hard cheese is the practical custom. Some have the custom to wait either an hour or half an hour after eating any type of dairy, based on what I just said there in the Zohar. The Mishnah Brura says, And one does not need to separate the meals with Bikada Mazon, and he does not eat hard cheese, rather he should wipe his mouth well and rinse, and then he may eat meat. Okay, and this is a very practical case, for example, on Shavuot, which we just celebrated. Many have the custom of starting with a dairy at the beginning, they have a loaf of bread and they have dairy. Then they finish off that bread, clean out their mouth, and then the main course is a meat meal with a meat loaf of bread. And so therefore, there is those positions to be lenient on, especially if one's using soft cheeses. But with the hard cheese, that becomes the issue. So with the hard cheese, and so therefore no, no Ashkenazim would have hard cheese, if they were doing this. So how do we do the hard, uh, what we're doing here with the hard cheese? So let's have a look here. And uh, the, the Taz suggests that this only follows Rashi, who was at one weight after eating meat due to the taste in one's mouth that lingers. Although this may be applicable to hard cheese, which has a strong taste, the reason of the Rambam that meat in between the teeth is considered halakhic significant does not apply. So that is true only concerning meat. But here, perhaps there's an issue of the cheese, especially the hard cheese, the taste will remain there for a long time, and I am going to need to wait. And he says, it seems, in my humble opinion, and as I've told you many times, there's no such thing as a humble opinion in halakha. If someone's going to take the trouble to write it down and publish a work, he's holding 100%. That's his bona fide position, and he loves it. It seems, in my opinion, that according to the reason of the Rambam that I mentioned at the beginning of the Siman, that for eating cheese after meat, it is because of the meat in between the teeth, but we're not concerned with the taste that lingers in the mouth from the meat. One can say that for all cheese, there's no prohibition to eat meat afterwards. As even concerning meat in between the teeth, we would not call it meat if the pasuk had not disclosed to us that the meat was still in between their teeth, as the Gemara says. For this reason, cheese in between the teeth is not considered cheese at all, it's just stuff. And, but 
if I look at the reason I mentioned it's due to Rashi, that the fat, it's because one should also forbid, for example, Swiss cheese, as the taste lingers in the mouth for a long time. Think of a very hard cheddar, which is gonna taste there for a long time. I'm not talking about American plastic cheese, which you guys uh, think is cheddar. It's not really strong, a nice English cheese. The taste is gonna stay there for a long time. So how long must one wait after eating hard cheese? Again, this is the Ashkenazic position. How long would they have to wait? The Taz says, V'yesh machmirin, peyush, lahamtin, sheish, sha'ot. So the Taz would wait six hours between meat and cheese. You wait six hours between cheese and meat. But the Shach, another commentary, another Polish commentator on the Shulchan Aruch says, one hour is enough. Clearly, he's more concerned with the Zohar than he is with waiting the same amount of time. So there are two main shitot, six hours and one hour. And of course, the Sephardic approach of zero hours, provided that you've uh, significantly rinsed out your mouth. Uh, the Sefer HaKashrut. Uh, writes that practically speaking, Ashkenazim should always wait six hours after eating hard cheese, but there are, as I said, different positions in the Sephardic world. Concerning our practice, the Benish Chai rules that it depends on how long the cheese was aged. If it was six months old cheese, it was aged for less, the one should wait less time. By contrast, Hacham of Ajah holds that one need not wait at all. And that is the main approach that we have, and that is the minhag in our community, not because of hacham of ajah, because that's just the way that our halacha developed, that we don't wait even after any hard cheese. So we can have our parmesan, we can do all of that at Kiddush, and then sit down and have chamin without any problems. There are some cases that are subject to dispute, even according to the Ashkenazic custom, according to the Taz and the Shach, Hard cheese is defined as cheese that is aged for six months or has similar characteristics to such cheese. It's got a strong or pungent taste. Nevertheless, some Israeli poskim, such as the Shevet Halevi, are stringent with regard to standard cheeses commonly known as yellow cheese in Israel, or those known as American cheese in the United States. So these too must be treated as hard cheese. But I don't know anyone who holds like, I mean, Clearly he does, but I don't know <laughs> others who hold like that. You can see that there. He's pretty strict there. You can see that in source number 13. Uh, and again, Rav Shlomo Zam and Arabach also was strict. And yeah, clearly there were others. So I do know people, but I don't know people who, I don't, okay. I know Poskim. I don't know people who do it practically like that. Uh, I'm going to go through some of these a little faster. Uh, Let's jump down to number 16, which is uh, Rav Avraham Gordema. Rabbi, Rabbi Gordema is a, uh, he works in, uh, in Kashrut in the United States. I think he works for the OU. Could be wrong on that one, so don't quote me. But uh, he's, he's a real expert in aged cheeses. It's one of those things, you have a, have a question on cheese, you always send it to Rav Gordema. And he writes here, yeah, he works for OU, there you go. The Shach explains that hard cheese is referred by the Rama means a cheese which has aged six months. Poskim note that after eating pungent, strong tasting cheeses, one should similarly wait before eating meat, regardless of the cheese's age. It is the position of the OU's poskim that one need only wait between eating aged cheese and meat if the cheese is a variety that's intentionally aged in production, such as Parmesan and Emmental. One need not wait after consuming non-aged cheeses that in then incidentally aged on refrigerator shelves and exhibits the same texture and taste as it should exhibit in its non-aged state. So therefore, Rav Gordon explains, and this is the normal Pesach in America for Ashkenazim, if it's a strong cheese like Parmesan, you wait six hours. If it's something like American cheese, or yellow cheese, then don't worry about it. There's no plastic cheese is gonna make someone have to wait six hours. Now we're gonna get into, so that's cheese, and we're done. Again, just to summarize, the Sephardic minhag, especially in Seattle, is to go straight after eating cheese, to eating meat, just clean out the mouth and brush those teeth and wash those hands. 
except for those who are Kabbalistic. But again, those people who would do that would be very private. They wouldn't share that publicly. Now, the Ashkenazic positions is, is if it is aged, you wait, you wait either one hour or mainly six hours. And uh, if it's American cheese, then don't worry about it. It's not really cheese, if you really want to know my honest opinion on that. Now, is milk the same as other dairy products? So it talks about cheese. What about milk? Okay, so that's a question. According to the Rashash, one need not wash one's hands or rinse one's mouth with solid food after drinking milk, since it is a liquid and the taste will be removed even by drinking a liquid alone. And the Rashash says it here, Davka givina maskinan sham de ba'ikinuach vahadacha. It's only specifically cheese where we conclude that one needs to do this eating of the bread or brushing of the teeth or rinsing it out because it clings to the, to the jaws and the palate and everything else. And between the teeth, but so you need to do that full cleansing with the bread, with the with the food stuff as well as the liquid. But with milk, just a rinse of the mouth. I can have a glass of milk, then have a glass of water, or a glass of wine, and go straight into the meat. And the Sefer Hakashrut and the Yabia Omer as are both lenient and uh, concerning milk. But Rafael Kohen is Mahmir in his Badei Shulchan, and he says, it's better to be strict about this, and if, you, if you're going to have a glass of milk, no harm, you should, no, no, no harm, one should take the effort of having, uh, of making sure you do the, the kinuach as well, of uh, cleaning it out with a food stuff, or as I said, uh, more practically speaking, brushing one's teeth. Okay, that's it. We have concluded dairy, uh, sorry, eating meat after dairy. Now we're going to move into separating between meat and dairy food. How careful do we need to be? Do we need separate kitchens? Do we need separate this? Do we need separate that? Separate refrigerators? Separate this? We're, go we're going to see it. Here it goes. There's a Mishnah in Masechet Chulin, Perchet, and says, Tzorer Adam Basar Gvina B'mitpachat Achat, you can have meat and cheese in one cloth, provided they do not come into direct contact with one another. It can be in one bag, you can put it, you can have it in the same groceries. So they tell you in, in QFC, Safeway, would you like separate bags for your meat and dairy? Not a problem, as long as they're not directly touching each other. Then the Gemara says in and what difference does it make if they touch each other? If it's cold, what's the problem? Says the Gemara, granted that cold food does not require klipa, peeling, of the place where they came into contact. You wouldn't have to cut off the, the, the cheese. But rinsing them off, surely I would need to do so. Okay, so if cheese and meat touch each other and they're cold, all you'd need to do is rinse them off. You would not need to cut off uh, an inch around or uh, as it were, you wouldn't need to do that. This is the ruling of Shulchan Aruch. He says as follows, if meat and cheese touch each other, mutarim, they are permitted. You just need to rinse off the place which they touched. And again, I'm talking about here when the meat and the cheese have no wrappings. If they've got wrappings, don't worry about it. You can, you can have them in the same cloth. You don't have to worry about them touching each other. Okay? So far, so good. And the Shach even quotes the Bach that if they're dry foodstuffs, they don't need require rinsing at all. Okay, so there we go. Seems to be pretty straightforward. And then there's another Mishnah here. Kol basar, 
asur le'echol bechalav. It is prohibited to cook any meat in milk. Okay, you can't have meat together with milk. Chutz mi basar dagim vechagavim. But you can cook fish and milk and even... Uh, I hope you're not having your dinner. Grasshoppers and milk. Again, that's the grasshoppers which have a. Uh, if you have the masora to eat particular grasshoppers, which uh, neither Ashkenazim or Sephardim today do, it's only the Yemenites, and uh, only a few of those know which. But if they do, if they like them, gezun to hate. Vasola alot im givina alashuchan. It is forbidden to bring it up, cheese on the same table with meat. Except for you can have cheese on the same table as fish. And grasshoppers, again, explain to us that fish and grasshoppers are not considered meat. You can, you can put chicken and cheese on the same table, provided that you don't eat them together. says you should neither bring them on the same table nor eat them together. Amar Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yossi said, Zo Beit Beit Hillel. This is one of the few instances where Beit Hillel is more strict than Beit Shammai. Be'ezeh Shulchan Amru. And what table are they saying where you're not allowed to have them on together? Be'shulchan she'ochel alav. That's talking about a table where you are eating upon it. About shulchan she sodeh alav et tavshil noten zeh besad zeh ve'ne choshesh. But if you are using a table to be preparing food, then you can have your meat section and your milk section, and there's no concern that you're going to have any issues. Says the shulchan aruch, afilu basar chayav of asol alato al shulchan she ochel alav kivina. You're not allowed to bring cheese on the same table as meat, even if it's only chicken, so you don't come to eat them together. But if you are preparing food, like it's a workbench, then you can have meat and chicken, sorry, chicken and cheese, or meat and cheese on the same table because you are working on them. Okay? Uh, let's skip that one. Let's move on. Two individuals eating meat and dairy at the same table. Now, this all basically comes down to, are you likely to eat your friend's food or not? Do you know who they are? So if I know Jerry, I mean, Jerry and I are good friends, but I'm not sure I would eat off Jerry's plate. But let's say I am next to one of my kids and they're not finishing their food, I'd be very easily want to eat their food. So therefore, it would be an issue if I'm having a meat meal and they're having a dairy one because I may want to eat their food. Whereas if Jerry and I, if Jerry's having dairy and I'm having meat, I respect Jerry too much to want to take food from his plate and I'm sure Jerry would feel the same about me as well. So the Mishnah says as follows, Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel Omer, Shnei achsanain ochlin al shulchan echad, ze basar ze gvina, me'ein choshishin. Rabban Shimon Gamliel says, two guests who are eating at the same table, one eating meat and one eating cheese, there's no concern. And the Gemara is going to try and understand why is there no concern. And he's going to explain it's because they don't know each other. But if they do know each other, it's a problem. But then it's a question of, if they do know each other, are they careful to eat off each other's food or not? So it says like this, That Mishnah, I said they can have meat and cheese on the same table, that's because they don't know each other. But if they do know each other, it's forbidden. So it could be a problem for me and Jerry. There's a brighter like this, Rabban Shamayon ben Gamliel Omer, Shnech Sanaim, Shenit Archul le Pundak, Echad Ze Ba Min Atzafon, Ze Ba Min Hadarom, Ze Ba Bechatichto, Ze Ba Begvinato, Ochlin al Shuchan Echad Ze Basav Ze Gvina, Vein Hoshishin, Velo Asu Elab Tfisa Achat. So the Mig explains here, Rabban Shimon Gamliel says, if two guests roomed in one inn, 
this one coming from the north and this one from the south, this one coming with his piece of meat and that one coming with his cheese. They may eat together on one table, this one eating meat and that one eating cheese, and they should not be concerned. And the Brighter adds, the Hachamim prohibited this practice only if they both eat from one parcel, one tfisa. Can it enter your mind that bright eye is actually referring to a case where they eat from the same place, the same portion? That would obviously be prohibited. Rather, it prohibits even in a manner as though they were eating from one parcel, i.e. when the diners are somewhat acquainted with each other, since neither would mind if the other ate from him. And this is the whole point here. Are they wanting to eat from the other? And that's my position. Even if I know someone, there's many people I know in Seattle, I'm not going to eat their food off their plate. It's a little chutzpah, it's a little rude. Chatzuf. But with close family and close, uh, with so many family in the same, in the same household and uh, very close friends, perhaps, you know, you can imagine high school kids and, and the like eating off each other's plates. But, you know, we're a little bit more dignified than that, perhaps. Taswan explained that if there's an item that separates between the two diners, they're permitted to continue eating together. And that's because the, the, it can act as a siman, as a reminder to them, well, you know what, pay attention, this person is eating meat and this person is eating dairy. Very similar to when a husband and wife are eating at the same table and there, if the wife is in nida, the man should not eat the, off the wife's plate. Why? Because by doing so, that, that, that's going to create arousal. But if there is a heker, if there is a sign between the two to remind them, you know, not to do so, this works too. So same thing for uh, for uh, for two strangers or two friends. If they have a sign between them, then they can be careful. It says like this. And if there is an object that separates, it's not considered like one parcel. And what is the case? Such as when there is an object of medium size height. Therefore, our custom now is that when one eats meat and one eats cheese at one table, we place bread on a container or a container or other utensils to separate between them or he eats on another tablecloth, which is like two parcels. And again, that's another way of doing it. If someone has a, their own uh, mini place setting and that works out. According to Tosfat, a separation in between the two diners will ensure they do not eat from the other's food. This is also the ruling of the Shulchan Aruch though, through the Ramah, also adds some details concerning what may be done with the sign. So he says here, that which is forbidden to bring to the table. That's when two people know each other well. Even if they are particular with each other, I, they would not normally share their food. But two people who very barely know each other, who don't recognize each other, Mutar is permitted. I feel I'm like here, even if they recognize each other. Im asu shum heker, they do some sort of reminder. Kagon shakol echad ochel amapash shalo, each one eats on their own table mat. Or shafil ochlim amapach, even though using a one tablecloth. When in benahem pat le heker, they place a piece of bread or something of the like as a reminder. It's permitted. The Ramah adds, well, Davka, this is specifically when they are not eating from the bread placed between them to be a sign. So the bread, they can't use the sign as a loaf to share. That bread has to be, uh, it's almost like it has to be like a, a porcelain piece of wood, a bread. It can't be a real piece of bread that they're eating. Uh, but if they eat from it, it is not a sign, as otherwise the bread from which they're eating is already placed on the table. But if they placed a cup used for drinking in between them, and otherwise it would normally be on the table. It would not normally be put on the table. So again, using something which would not normally be there, it's considered a valid sign, even though they drink from the utensil. And certainly, if they place a lamp there or other things on the table, it's considered a valid sign. And they should be careful not to drink from one utensil since the food gets stuck to the utensils. So again, make sure that the what it's doing is really what it's doing. Don't play, you can't play both sides of this. You have to know why what you're really using. Okay, the Taz writes that the object placed as a sign must be placed there with the purpose of being a sign rather than for some other reason. You can see that there. 
the Pitchei Teshuva adds that if the two individuals are sitting at a distance from each other, such that one cannot simply take food from the other without standing and walking to him, then no sign is necessary, as he will remember not to do so. And then you can see that there in source number 30. And Rabbi Akiva Ega adds that... Uh, it does not help to place a shomer next to him who will supervise him. But if he eats on a tablecloth and his companion on the table, that is sufficient. So don't try to appoint someone to help you. Rather, you just need to make sure that you are doing your own separating factor. So one person's eating dairy at a table with meat on it. What happens there? What is the halakha if a person wishes to eat dairy alone, but there's also meat on the table, or vice versa? According to the hachmat, the hochmat adam, this is permitted as the concern that one may eat from the food of another is not relevant here. That's where Rabdan's exposition. However, the hafla'a, forbids eating dairy here and explains that it's permitted where two people do not know each other since the other will remind him not to do so if he wishes to eat his food. But here, there's no one who will remind him not to consume the meat at the same time as the dairy. The Yaakut Yosef holds, though, that in this case, if one also appoints a Shamer, then it is permitted to eat dairy there if one also places a sign. So again, this is a question here of whether Shamrim are helpful or not helpful. Best piece of advice, don't put yourself in that situation. It's not a very good idea. On the other hand, maybe we should be less animalistic and we should be able to control ourselves to the fact, I always notice this with this, I've never had an issue throughout my uh, life of uh, enjoying food. I've never had a temptation to eat meat and milk together. So I guess we, by that definition, we can all have some level of self-control. So that there wouldn't be an issue there either. Now the question is, if someone who ate meat within six hours is permitted to sit at a table with one eating dairy, or are we concerned that he may come to inadvertently eat dairy? The pre megadim writes that although some poskim are stringent about this, proactive halacha is that you can indeed be lenient. And again, no need to have chumrat just for the sake of it. Uh, we continue. Basically, meat and dairy in one container. Okay, is it permitted to place a pot or a small container of meat together with one of dairy in a larger container? Says the Shulchan Aruch, Mutar iten betoch teva kan shel basa etel shel chalav. It's meant to place a container of meat next to one of dairy within a carton. Again, I think this is basically explained to us the modern day refrigerator. Can I put meat and dairy in the same thing? Can I put meat and dairy in the same uh, pantry? Probably not, because you probably keep them all refrigerated. But refrigerators, freezers, no problem. Taz explains there's no concern for mixing meat and dairy here. It is permitted to place in a container since people are careful that meat and dairy should not fall from one into the other. The Ramah adds, one is strict normally, but it's best to be cautious in cases where there is no need. And again, I think he's dealing with there, but it could be a pot of meat more, and they're cooking together. And that's the case. And the, the Shach is explaining here, why is there concern? When they're uncovered. And there there's a concern that perhaps it's going to fall in. And again, when I put all these things which are properly sealed over and I've used ceramic wrap or I'm using foil or I've got Tupperware or I've got lids or these things are closed, no issue whatsoever. Okay? And the Yalkut Yosef rules that for Sfaradim, one may place meat and dairy into containers, into the refrigerator, even if they're not covered, though he has, it's proper to cover at least one of the containers. And again, normally that's what we do. I'm not, again, I'm not sure. I don't really like even uncovered containers. It just makes your refrigerator smell. So therefore, that's what's recommended there. And I think the Rubisa has a question. She's next to me, not on the screen, but she has a question. Yes, dear. <laughs> Um, what if the food that the others are eating is not kosher? So there's no temptation, you're eating with coworkers and you have your kosher 
dairy food from home and they're eating meat around you. Can you be eating at the same table? Mm, an interesting question. And we haven't seen it yet in the sources, but I would say that uh, it would not be an issue based on what I said, that uh, normally we have a temptation for something which is mutar, for something which is permitted, something which is not permitted, but generally you're not careful with. And therefore, as I said, I'm not generally, it's not really a problem. When do you feel that, like, that, for example, the temptation to want to have ice cream after a meal? It's not within the first hour or two. Normally it's within like the fourth or fifth hour or near the end. And then we would have seen that there's room to be lenient. So I would say that uh, that wouldn't be an issue. All right, we have finished right now what I wanted to cover. And uh, next time we're going to talk about whether we need to have special loaves of bread, like dairy bread or meat bread, and do these things need to have special signs and everything else. I'm going to uh, pause at this time.